Okay, we are we are up. And so in the Gospel of Mark, um, we've already uh, made sure that we, we have a clear understanding that when Mark was writing this, he wanted to express the authority of Jesus. And we'll see that once again. And, and each time we've gotten together, this is part five, and each of the first four parts, we've seen the authority of God uh, and the authority of Jesus Christ and how Jesus Christ did the will of the Father um, and how uh, he was pushing um, through, no matter what it was that he had to face with the crowds, with the persecution, with whatever it was, trusting in the Father to meet his needs while he was here in this world uh, so that he could fulfill his his destiny, uh, the, the true will of the Father for his life, his purpose was to come here and to sacrifice his life and usher in the kingdom of heaven for all of mankind, all who will turn towards him. So we're picking up in chapter seven and we'll start right out. It says, then the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus. They were more than just curious. Uh, they uh, were probing. They were they didn't understand Jesus um, for the most part. And so they all gathered around Jesus and they saw some of his disciples. They were eating with hands that were defiled. This was an atrocity, especially to the Jews, because they lived according to stern rules and traditions. And they valued them greatly because they in their hearts believed they were doing everything they did unto God, uh, what they had, what they didn't realize was that they were actually, their God wasn't the true one living God. Uh, they had strayed from that. They now followed a religious practice. And as they saw that uh, Jesus's disciples were eating with, with hands that were defiled, it, it was appalling to them. And just as they would with any other Jew, they would chastise them and they'd set them straight on what the scriptures say. And so they, you know, they weren't washing their hands properly according to tradition. So now in holding to the tradition of the elders, the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat until they wash their hands ceremonially. Now, that doesn't mean if they just washed their hands before they entered the tent or wherever they were eating or their house, but then they had to go through this ceremony of washing their hands because it was passed down from the elders. And so as they watched these disciples not washing their hands, made them feel extremely uncomfortable. And on returning from the market, they do not eat unless they wash. So whenever they go out, they come back ceremonially wash uh, before they eat anything. And there are many other traditions that they observe, including the washing of cups, pitchers, kettles, uh, couches for dining. So the Pharisees and the scribes, they immediately question Jesus. Why do your disciples not walk according to the traditions of the elders? Now, this is a, an interesting thing because Jesus said, follow me. So then, therefore, anyone who follows Jesus walks as Jesus walks. But the Pharisees and the scribes, they weren't familiar with that. And they were saying, we're supposed to walk according to our traditions and our laws and the things that we observe. And he said they don't do that. Instead, they eat with defiled hands. So Jesus answered them. He said, Isaiah prophesied correctly about you, you hypocrites. It, because it's written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. They teach as doctrine the precepts of men. You have disregarded the commandment of God to keep the tradition of men. He went on to say, you neatly set aside the command of God to maintain your own tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. 
But you say that if a man says to his father or his mother, whatever you would have received from me, meaning whatever um, resources or or monetary means, uh, it, it's Corbin, which that means is a gift that was devoted to God. So I'm not going to give it to you, mom and dad, because I'm giving it to God. So by doing that, Jesus chastises them for following their own traditions. He is no longer permitted to do anything for his father and mother at that point. And so where's the honor in that? So they're breaking the commandments because they didn't understand the commandments. They were so deluded and stretched out, much like we see today with what, what most people call Christianity. It's so deluded and so stretched out that it doesn't even resemble what Christ was teaching. What Jesus is teaching right here is the same problem that exists today. So he went on to say, thus you nullify the word of God by the tradition that you've handed down. You can't hear the voice of God because all you pay attention to is the law, your traditions, and your practices. And you do so in many such matters. In other words, he wasn't just saying narrow it down to this issue. In many matters, you do this. Once again, Jesus called the crowd to him and he said, all of you, listen and understand. Nothing that enters a man from the outside can defile him. But the things that come out of a man, these are what defile him. After Jesus had left the crowd and gone into the house, his disciples, well, of course, they, it, this is a teaching moment, a little koinonia. They wanted to know. And so they inquired about the parable. Are you still so dull, Jesus said? He, he says, do you not understand? Nothing that enters a man from the outside can defile him. He was talking spiritually, supernaturally, because it does not enter his heart but it goes into the stomach and then is eliminated. Thus, he was saying that all foods are clean. So anybody even to this day that says, well, no, God said that this food is unclean. Well, they're contradicting what Jesus said. Are you following this God or that God? Or are you following Jesus? Because according to Jesus, he said right here, it's not what goes in, but it, it's what comes out that defiles the man. So he continued, what comes out of a man, that is what defiles him. For from within the hearts of men come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, debauchery, envy, slander, arrogance, and foolishness. All these evils come from within. And these are what defile a man. I mean, Jesus was just telling his disciples exactly the difference between what, what practices and traditions have to do with being pure in the eyes of God, following Jesus. And Jesus left that place and he went to the region of Tyre. Not wanting anyone to know that he was there, he entered a house. So Jesus was trying to just covertly go to, to Tyre, and he went into a house. But he was unable to escape their notice because they were all on the lookout for Jesus. Instead, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit, demonic presence, soon heard about Jesus. And she came and she fell at his feet. Now, she was a Greek. She wasn't a Jew. She was a Greek from um, Syrophoenicia. Um, she was a uh, Syrophoenician. And uh, Syrophoenicians were from a part of Syria that was ruled by uh, the Phoenician uh, region of Rome or the, during the Roman Empire. So Phoenicia was set up by the, the Romans, and it was in Syria, and that's where she was from. And she kept asking Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. And she wasn't even a Jew. She just knew that Jesus could do this. She knew this by faith that Jesus could do this. And 
she just kept asking him. And so at that point, first let the little children have their fill, Jesus said. First let the little children have their fill. For it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. That was quite a bold statement that Jesus made because a lot of people wouldn't understand what he was saying. He's speaking to a non-Jew, and he was talking about the little children being the Jews, God's selected people, chosen people. He said, let them have their fill first, and then we'll go ahead and we'll toss the rest of the dogs, meaning the Gentiles or the non-Jews. He and, and she said, oh, oh, yes, Lord, she replied. Even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Her point was just so pure. She said that even the, the unclean uh, non-Jews will take the scraps that are left over by the Jews. Then Jesus told her, because of this answer, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. He saw her faith and he had authority to just speak it and it was done. And she went home and she found her child lying on the bed and the demon was gone. Then Jesus left the region of Tyre and he went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of the Decapolis. Now some people brought to him a man who was deaf and hardly able to speak. And they begged Jesus to place his hands on him. Once again, they, they were asking in faith if Jesus would heal this person. So Jesus took him aside privately. And we see this often that Jesus wanted to do things privately. He was doing the will of the Father and he was just following the way that, that the, he was being led. How many times in our own lives when we follow Jesus, do we just need to go maybe away privately because the Holy Spirit's leading us that way. But so many people want not to do it privately. They want to do it out in the open so they can be recognized. But Jesus was doing the opposite here. He went away from the crowd. And then he put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spit and he touched the man's tongue. And looking up to heaven, he was speaking to the Father. He sighed deeply and he said to him, um, apta, which means to be open. And immediately the man's ears were open and his tongue was released and he began to speak plainly. Now, if you've ever heard somebody speak with a speech impediment because they had a difficult time hearing or they couldn't hear at all, and I had very good friends of mine growing up who actually were in this condition and they struggled with their speech this man had the same thing. To think that that just by the Lord touching him and healing him, he could speak plainly. And Jesus ordered them not to tell anyone. But the more he ordered them, the more widely they proclaimed it. No, 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 no. We got to tell people what you just did, Jesus. This is just incredible. This man, we couldn't understand what he was saying before, and he couldn't hear us, and now he can hear clearly, and he's speaking plainly. So the people were utterly astonished. And he said, he has done this thing well, the people said. Jesus is awesome. He's done this thing well. He makes even the deaf hear and the mute hear speak. This was not something that they were used to. And that takes us through the end of chapter 7, and we'll move into chapter 8. And in those days, the crowd once again became very large. I mean, the word just spread. Wherever Jesus went, people were coming. People were coming for a lot of different reasons, as, as I've shared earlier. Some were coming just to watch the magic show. Some were coming because their faith wanted to seek healing. Some were coming because they were just rubbernecking. Others had no reason why they were there other than the crowd was going, and they were just going along with the crowd. And these people, with being that the, the crowd was so large, they had nothing to eat. So now they're in the precarious situation that they were in earlier, where they had this huge crowd of people and there was nothing for them to eat. So Jesus called the disciples to him and he said, 
I have compassion for this crowd because they have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will faint along the way. Jesus knew, hey, these folks, they were all here. They've been with me for three days and they haven't really eaten. So we're going to give them something to eat. And for He said some of them have come from a great distance because the word got out. So his disciples replied, where in this desolate place could anyone find enough bread to feed all these people? And, you know, Jesus just kind of looked down and said, how many loaves do you have? And they said seven. And he instructed them uh, for the crowd to sit down on the ground. Then he took the seven loaves and he gave thanks and he broke them. And he gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And they distributed them to the crowd. They also had a few small fish. And Jesus blessed them. And he ordered that these be set before them as well. So they were feeding bread and fish to the crowd, the multitude. The people ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. And you remember they picked up 12 basketfuls in, a, in the prior occasion when Jesus performed this miracle. Now they picked up another seven. And it says there were about 4,000 men present. And once again, this didn't count women and children. So maybe there were 20,000 people in this crowd. And they still picked up seven back basketfuls of food when Jesus was done. And as soon as Jesus had dismissed the crowd, he got into the boat with his disciples and he went to the dis district of Dalmatia. When the Pharisees came and began to argue with Jesus, testing him by demanding from him a sign from heaven. We want to see a sign from you, Lord. Jesus sighed deeply in his spirit and he said, why does this generation demand a sign? Truly, I tell you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them, got back into the boat, and crossed over to the other side. We see the same thing today. People want to see. They don't want to follow Jesus because they don't see him. They want to see something. Uh, give me something to go by that I know that I'm following you, Jesus. Well, we're supposed to walk by faith, not by sight. And that's exactly the point that Jesus was making here. He says, you know, you're sitting here demanding a sign. Why are you following me? So you can watch the magic show. So you can see the Jerry Springer show um, today. That's what people are doing. They want to go and see what's going on. And they want to see all these miracles instead of just developing a personal relationship with Christ. And he knew that. So he got back in the boat and he, he just crossed over to the other side. Now, this, the disciples, they had forgotten to take bread with them. You know, after all this food that he fed all those people, and guess what? Oops, who brought the bread? I don't know. Well, they they forgot to take the bread with them, except they had one loaf that they had with them in the boat. Uh, and so Jesus turns to them and says, watch out. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of Herod, meaning the religious people, the Jews that were religious. So they began to discuss with one another the fact that they had no bread. Oh, I know why he said that. Um, and aware of the conversation, Jesus asked them, why are you debating about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Do you have such hard hearts? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many basketfuls of broken pieces you collected? And 12 all in total. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, well, how many basketfuls of broken pieces did you collect? They said seven. Then he asked them, do you still not understand? What Jesus was telling them is, with God, all things are possible. There is no limitation. If there's 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 people, you're working with seven fish, five fish, or one fish. I can 
produce this because of the power of God. Are you so hard-hearted that you don't have enough faith to see the authority that has been granted to me by the Father? So when they arrived at Bethsaida, some people brought a blind man and they begged Jesus to touch him. So he took the blind man by the hand and he led him out of the village. Then he spit on the man's eyes and he placed his hands on him. Can you see anything, he asked. The man looked up and he said, I can see the people, but they look like trees walking around. Once again, Jesus placed his hands on the man's eyes. And when he opened them, his sight was restored. And he could see everything clearly. Jesus sent him home and said, do not go back into the village. Then Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he questions his disciples. He said, who do the people say that I am? And they replied, some say that you're John the Baptist. Others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? Well, Peter stepped forward and he answered, he said, you are the Christ. And Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priest, and the scribes, and then he must be killed, and after three days he would rise again. So he's sharing this with his disciples, and um, they're trying to suck it in, but, but surely they, they didn't really understand what he was explaining. He spoke this message quite frankly, and when he did, Peter, he took him aside, and he began to rebuke him, Lord, I can't believe you're saying this, but Jesus turning and look at his, and look at, at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and he said, get behind me, Satan, for you do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. This is where faith is not understanding and not seeing, but simply trusting and following. And Jesus told Peter straight up, who out of his own compassion for Jesus, was going to say it's not so. They can never kill you. And, and immediately he was rebuked and, and in a harsh way in front of everyone and say, get behind me, Satan. That is not coming from the spirit of God. That's coming from the spirit of this world. And he said, you're, you're thinking like men, not spiritually. So then Jesus called the crowd to him. At this point, he was talking to just his disciples. Now he brings the crowd back in. He's come on over. And so they all come along with his disciples. And he told them, if anyone wants to come after me, well, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, interestingly enough, today, we say this so boldly and so, I mean, so as a matter of fact, because we know Jesus died on the cross and, you know, we have to take up our cross and follow. Jesus hadn't died on the cross. Now, crucifixion was a very well-known practice. And so what Jesus wasn't saying was try to pretend that you're like me. He was saying, hey, guess what? When someone stands for what they believe in, they need to pick up their cross daily and follow me. They need to be ready to sacrifice their lives daily. Because that's what people did when they were crucified. They sacrificed their lives. That's what Jesus eventually did on the cross. So he's telling them, you're going to have to sacrifice your life. You're going to have to give your whole life up if you really want to follow me. Jesus wasn't pulling any punches. And he said, for Whoever wants to save his life is not willing to sacrifice his life totally. He says, we'll lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and for the gospel, the good news, the kingdom, will save it. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world 
yet forfeit his soul. That's the ultimate loss. And Jesus was being plain with, he didn't just say it to his disciples, he pulled the whole crowd together. He says, hey, listen, everybody, this, this is for all of you. If anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. What does that mean? Well, for whoever wants to save his life, will lose it. And whoever wants to lose his life for my sake and for the gospel will save it. And what does it profit a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit his very soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? So many people in this world try to sell their souls for this and sell their souls for that. They want, they desire, they lust after things. But he says, what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words, in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. And so that concludes chapter 8 and part 5 of the Gospel of Mark.